Thank you all for being here. So the menopause transition is, um, it is a hot topic right now. It's also um, a time when many of us uh, find ourselves confused about what's going on in our lives and our bodies. And so we are going to shed some light on that tonight. Um, so by the end of this talk, um, I hope that you will understand the hormonal changes we go through during perimenopause, menopause, and beyond, gain some clarity about the history and safety of hormone therapy, learn about other options for managing your symptoms as well if um, hormone therapy is not for you, and identify some habits that are really beneficial for our health at midlife and beyond. Um, I am going to use some gender-specific language um, in this talk, um, and I just want to acknowledge that not all people who experience menopause identify as women. Um, these symptoms that we're going to talk about will relate to anyone born with ovaries, um, with the exception of transgender individuals who are taking hormones for that purpose who may not experience menopause or may experience it differently, um, which is beyond the scope of this talk. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of personal background because this is a personal topic for me as well as a professional passion. Um, I am a midlife woman. I am 51 years old. Um, I became a certified nurse midwife in 2001. And a year after that, the Women's Health Initiative study came out, which I'm going to talk more about um, in uh, the presentation, which um, was a big study on hormone therapy that scared um, most people out of um, taking and most providers out of prescribing hormone therapy. And so um, I also had um, a mother who had breast cancer when I was 15. Um, so I just assumed that I would never take hormone therapy. Um, and I started um, having perimenopausal symptoms at age 41. So I tried every other thing that there was and um, did not find anything super helpful for all the symptoms I was experiencing. So then I really started digging into this topic, both for my own um, personal needs, because I realized that um, I, like most healthcare providers, had only gotten one lecture on menopause and menopause care, and that includes physicians, internal medicine docs, gynecologists. Um, we don't get enough of this um, training or we haven't historically, I hope that that's changing. And um, it inspired me to become a menopause certified provider. Um, I'm also a yoga teacher and a life coach. And so um, that's why I really wanted to include some information about habits in this talk today, because um, we all know that lifestyle changes are so important. Uh, lifestyle is important. Making changes can be challenging. And I wanted to give you some ideas and some tools for that. Um, and the truth is that the menopause transition is not just a biological uh, change, although that is very significant. Um, it is hormonal, it is age-related, and it also comes with a lot of social changes, um, life changes, psychological changes, um, mood, stress changes, potentially. We have our personal meanings of menopause uh, that can impact how we experience this time. And historically in our culture, it's really been a time that has um, not been talked about enough in a positive way. It often is the time when people feel like everything's going downhill. So I love this quote from Brene Brown, who is a um, very well-known um, speaker and researcher. And she has a beautiful essay about midlife that I highly recommend. And this is a small excerpt from it. And she says, midlife is when the universe gently places her hands upon your shoulders pulls you close and whispers in your ear, I'm not screwing around. Time is growing short. There are unexplained, adventure, unexplored adventures ahead of you. You were born worthy of love and belonging. Courage and daring are coursing through your veins. You were made to live in love with your whole heart. It's time to show up and be seen. So let's embrace our midlife. I love that. And um, that's my attitude toward it. So I want to empower you all with good information so you can make good decisions for yourselves. Um, we do need to have some definitions. We all are on the same page. Perimenopause is the time from the onset of any menstrual cycle irregularities or other menopause symptoms until the end of the 12 months after your final menstrual period. The climacteric is not a term used often anymore, but it essentially is interchangeable with perimenopause. Uh, menopause is uh, 
in a, a natural menopause has to be defined after you have had 12 consecutive months of no period. Um, menopause can also be induced by surgery or chemo. The average age of natural menopause is 51 or 52. Um, early menopause is considered before 45. And postmenopause is the rest of our lives after menopause. We're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of terminology in here. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief overview. Uh, the term menopausal hormone therapy or MHT is preferred now over HRT. And we use HRT or hormone replacement therapy now more for um, people who are under age 45 going through menopause who need their hormone levels actually replaced at the uh, age appropriate levels. If a woman has had a hysterectomy, she can take estrogen alone. So that's estrogen therapy. If you have a uterus, you need to have estrogen and a progestogen or progesterone therapy. Hot flashes are also known as vasomotor symptoms or VMS. The genitourinary syndrome of menopause um, has replaced a, a less preferable term, vaginal atrophy, which we're glad to have ushered out. Um, the um, most commonly, uh, the original form of hormone therapy was Premarin or conjugated equine estrogens. It's going to come up in the WHI study. Um, Provera is uh, the synthetic progesterone that was used in that study. Micronized progesterone is a natural form of progesterone I'll talk about. And the Menopause Society, which was formerly known as the North American Menopause Society, um, is the expert authority on menopause research and guidelines, and I'll refer to them several times. So why don't we talk about menopause as much as we talk about puberty? I have a couple funny cartoons in here. <laughs> I understand it now. Menopause is just puberty's evil older sister. And that's probably how a lot of us feel, but why don't we talk about this poor older sister enough? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And um, one of them is that we have a pretty high tolerance in our culture for women's suffering. We're very focused on youth. There's a lot of shame and stigma and fear around aging, hormones, concerns about cancer. There's a lack of accurate information. And there's a need for more provider education to get providers up to date, which is also something that I have been um, doing a lot of in this past year. We uh, need to talk about menopause because there's a lot of midlife women who are going through this phase of life. There's, you know, a total between uh, perimenopause and menopause, 40s and oh, 50s and overs, that's 80 million U.S. women. 85% of us will experience symptoms and will live up to 40% of our lives after menopause. So this is a very important topic and thing for us to be well informed about. Menopausal changes significantly affect our mood, sleep, sex, relationships, workability, quality of life. Midlife women are often at the peak of their careers and or family responsibilities. And the decisions that we make about our health at this point in our lives really set a trajectory for the um, rest of our lives. Um, so... We also need to think about our quality of life, which is very important. Um, we want to, um, we have things we want to accomplish. We have um, goals we want to achieve and it's it just feeling at home in our bodies is important to being able to do those things. And we wanna enjoy the rest of our lives. We wanna be with the people we love. Not talking about menopause also has some high costs. There are um, a lot of women in this age group leaving the workforce early due to perimenopause, um, perimenopausal struggles. Untreated hot flashes are costing us a lot of money every year. There's a missed opportunity if we don't talk about menopause to decrease our health risks. And there are mood changes related to hormonal changes that may be missed and misdiagnosed in the menopausal transition. And these untreated symptoms can significantly affect our quality of life and relationships. But isn't menopause natural? That is a common question. And of course, yes, menopause is natural. But our ancient ancestors rarely lived past age 30. And until the 1920s, uh, women didn't even live very long past menopause consistently. 
um, modernization and modern medicine have kept us alive longer. And now we have an average life expectancy of 80. But that longevity also comes with chronic health conditions like heart disease, diabetes, arthritis. So this is a great time to start thinking not only about our lifespan, but our health span, about how we can stay healthy and have a good quality of life through those years rather than just staying alive. And this is a perfect turning point and an important turning point to consider all of those factors. So what are the hormonal changes that happen in the menopause transition? Well, I, I love this little cartoon because it's kind of silly, but it really gives us a good um, review of the menstrual cycle so that we can know where we're starting from. Where are we trans what are we transitioning from? Um, so as a little review, through our reproductive years, we have um, uh, the pituitary gland secreting follicle-stimulating hormone to stimulate our ovaries so that they produce, uh, they develop the follicles and uh, help us ovulate so that we can get pregnant every month if we want to. Um, these follicles produce estrogen. And then after ovulation, the um, remaining, uh, what's left over of the follicle, the corpus luteum produces progesterone and the estrogen builds up the uterine lining and the progesterone makes it nice and juicy so that if there's a fertilized egg that wants to implant, it's ready to support it. And then when that doesn't happen, we have our period. So every month there's a cycling of these hormones uh, and throughout our lives, we use up these follicles. And uh, when we get to a certain point, and that's different for every person, um, when there's a certain uh, low level of follicles, the ovaries uh, recognize that this change is impending and they start to pump out more follicles to try to maintain regular cycles. Um, so we're... Um, losing our follicles, our ovulation becomes irregular. We start to have either no ovulation or to ovulate even twice in a cycle. So that's where we get these um, different symptoms that start popping up potentially at this time. Um, our follicular phase gets more compressed and we spend more time in the luteal phase, which leads to um, often more PMS symptoms, which is super fun. All right, and then in the later menopause transition, we um, end up with uh, more missed periods um, and estrogen deficiency symptoms that are becoming more common. Um, Jeff, I don't know, I see your photo on here instead of my video for some reason, but I'm not sure if you can fix that. Um, the follicle numbers eventually get so low that estrogen and progesterone production stops. Um, lab testing is not super helpful at this point because it doesn't really define menopausal status. The only time we use that is when people have either um, had a hysterectomy, so not having a period, or with a progesterone IUD where they may not be having a period either. Um, the FSH is um, a uh, test that we can use for menopausal status in that situation, um, but it's you know only really useful way after the fact. So this is what our um, estrogen and progesterone are doing over our lifespan. And I like to show this um, because you can see here's our uh, normal menstrual cycle up and down, up and down during our reproductive years. And then during the perimenopausal period, things start to go haywire. Um, the progesterone drops off First, and the estrogen is kind of up and down, um, very rocky cliff here until it finally crashes and burns. And that's why we get a lot of crazy symptoms. And then this is just to show that our follicle stimulating hormone does keep going up for a while, trying to get those ovaries to respond as estrogen goes down. Estrogen receptors are in every single tissue in a woman's body. So that is why we get so many symptoms during menopause. And um, this is just to demonstrate the extent of those symptoms. They affect every uh, body system, our brains, our senses, our um, obviously our temperature regulation, our sleep, our hair and skin, our joints, our digestive system, and our genitourinary system. 
So we're going to get into these a little bit more and talk about the most common um, problems that we have during perimenopause and menopause. And the number one um, or the least favorite symptom of most people is hot flashes. So hot flashes are um, a sudden intense sensation of heat in the upper body generally. They may be accompanied by perspiration, chills, anxiety, palpitations. Um, for sure, people can sweat a lot, particularly at night when they have hot flashes. Um, and the cause of hot flashes is really not entirely understood, um, but may be related to multiple body systems and particularly a narrowing of the thermoneutral zone in the hypothalamus. Um, and this is important in terms of some of the treatments for um, hot flashes that we're going to talk about. Um, so what else is happening during a hot flash? Well, our heart rate goes up blood pressure increases, the heart is working harder, we can have palpitations, there are cortisol spikes um, that can cause an inflammatory response and damage to our blood vessels, our bad cholesterol goes up. Um, those cortisol spikes spike our blood sugar, which over time contributes to weight gain. Interrupted sleep also causes more cortisol spikes and inflammation, mood changes, and brain fog. That inflammation affects blood vessels in the brain, which contributes again to the brain fog or you know slower processing time, uh, difficulty with word recall that many people experience, especially during perimenopause. And this is significant. This is not minor stuff. Women who have more hot flashes for longer periods of time also have increased rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, fractures, dementia, and poor quality of life. And they're very common, 60 to 80% of women will experience hot flashes at some point in the menopause transition, and a lot of women during perimenopause as well. Um, there are um, slight differences by race and ethnicity. Um, the median duration is for, uh, for generally that uh, people have hot flashes for seven to 10 years. Um, black women actually have a higher rate of hot flashes and tend to have them longer. And uh, all women who experience hot flashes the, who start earlier actually are likely to have them the longest. So earlier does not mean you get out of them sooner, unfortunately. Bone loss is also a significant impact of the menopause transition. Um, estrogen deficiency causes our bone reabsorption to be more rapid than the formation of new bone. So we have progressive bone density loss and deterioration of the bone microarchitecture, which puts us at risk for fractures. And fractures are quite common, unfortunately. There's over 2 million fractures each year in the U.S. due to osteoporosis, mostly in postmenopausal women. And um, there's high morbidity and mortality, meaning people really suffer a lot of um, debility, uh, disability from these fractures and uh, unfortunately can often be a precursor to someone's ultimate death um, if they're not really able to recover fully from that fracture. More uh, women will suffer from an osteoporotic fracture than from breast cancer, heart attacks, and strokes combined. So this is a significant issue. Um, the genitourinary syndrome of menopause is another um, major uh, issue that we deal with after, or it could be even during perimenopause, um, but certainly in the menopausal and postmenopausal period, the vagina has estrogen receptors in all three layers um, that are, and the estrogen is responsible for the blood flow, collagen, moisture, and microbiome of the vagina. So a loss of estrogen leads to thinning of the tissue, a loss of elasticity, narrowing, um, it can lead to a change in pH that can uh, predispose to more bacterial vaginosis. Um, there can be symptoms of dryness, burning, irritation, pain with sex, urinary symptoms, and decreased pelvic floor function. Other physiologic changes um, besides the inflammation that I mentioned in the vessels that can affect the brain, there's also a decrease in white and gray matter in perimenopause that is seen on MRI. Um, so we, we know that there are brain changes. Now, this is not necessarily associated with any future risk of dementia. It's a very um, specific time, specific issue in perimenopause. And the brain fog is usually transitory and temporary. Um, 
Estrogen affects obviously our skin. So there's decreased collagen production as well. And then there's a change in our body composition. There's an increase in body fat and a decrease in lean body mass related to the menopause transition. So what you're probably thinking now is that I'm to look forward to 10 years of health followed by death. Am I missing anything? Sounds great, huh? No, I have good news. Okay, so let's get into our solutions because there are really a lot of options now for helping with all these symptoms. This is probably the best time to be going through menopause in history. So I don't want you to all be um, feeling down about all of this. <laughs> Number one we're going to talk about is hormone therapy because hormone therapy is the gold standard for treating hot flashes. And it has been in the media a lot. Sue is right. This is a very hot topic. Um, the New York Times has put out two, these are just two examples of really excellent journalism that they've done in the past year on menopause, which is great since they were also part of um, the, the media blitz on the Women's Health Initiative 20 years ago. So they're helping to update the public on what has been going on. And I, I'm sorry that these articles, of course, are behind the New York Times paywall, but there are also a lot of other media outlets that are free and out there. Um, really, Oprah's done a lot about menopause lately. So there's tons, uh, luckily, tons of conversation about menopause happening. I think it's important to understand the history of hormone therapy so that we can all understand why did we get so scared of it and why do we think it's okay again? Um, it was first introduced in the 50s. Ayers Labs produced the first estrogen tablets from pregnant mare's urine, and that is still on the market as Premarin or the conjugated equine estrogens that I mentioned in the first slide. It became very popular in the 60s, and then in the 70s is when they realized that just giving estrogen without progesterone increased the risk of endometrial cancer, and that adding the progesterone decreased that risk even below the, the risk of someone not taking hormones. So now we can do that very safely, but that wasn't understood in the beginning of hormone therapy. And in the 80s and 90s, hormone therapy was really um, the standard of care. There was a lot of medical consensus that it was safe and very beneficial for our uh, hearts and bones and decreasing the risk of colon cancer and increasing our life expectancy with no concerns about breast cancer. And then the Women's Health Initiative study came out in 2002, which was the largest randomized controlled trial of hormone therapy in women aged 50 to 79. It was very expensive study. It was um, very ex highly covered when it was abruptly halted due to finding a slight but significant increase in the risk of breast cancer and also a concern about increased risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, and pulmonary embolism. And very quickly, hormone therapy prescription rates went down. So what was wrong with the WHI? What do we know now after reanalyzing this data over and over? Uh, well, one issue was that they only studied one type of hormone therapy, which was oral pills of Premarin for women with uh, who'd had a hysterectomy and for women with their uterus, uh, Premarin plus Provera or PremPro. Um, they didn't study transdermal. They didn't look at any other options. Um, they limited enrollment of women who were younger than 60 or were, who were fewer than 10 years from menopause. So the median age of the participants was 63. Now, if the median age of menopause is 51, uh, obviously you can see this is a little bit skewed. And part of why they did that is they were trying to figure out if giving estrogen to older women who had been 10 years or further out from menopause, if that would reduce their risk of heart disease. And what they found was that did not happen. In fact, it was the opposite. So um, instead of making it clear in the media coverage of this story that this was the, the concerning outcomes were specifically in, a, in the older population, they generalized these results to the entire population of peri- and postmenopausal women who were seeking hormone therapy and did not discern what the risk was by age or time from menopause. The impact was that then a generation of clinicians was frightened out of prescribing hormone therapy and a generation of women were not offered hormone therapy at the appropriate time when it may have benefited them. 
It also led to the rise of the bi compounded bioidentical hormone replacement therapy industry. Um, and bioidentical uh, hormones are not something that's recognized by the FDA, but we do use that term a lot now because what it has come to mean, and that people are very familiar with it, is hormones that are chemically identical to those that we produce in our ovaries in contrast to the ones that come from uh, horses. Many FDA-approved formulations of hormone therapy are bioidentical. Going to compounding pharmacies is not necessary. They're uh, it's less regulated. There's less safety precautions, and there's often a lot of unnecessary lab work that those um, providers and pharmacies require that's really not necessary. But what was good about the WHI is it gathered a huge amount of data on menopausal women, and it helped us come up with the timing hypothesis, which is based on reanalysis of the data, which show that starting women on hormone therapy early, meaning less than 10 years postmenopause and or less than at less than 60 years of age is safe and reduces the associated risks and increases the benefits. So since then, we've got 20 years of research telling us that estrogen is safe. It's the gold standard. It's FDA approved for treating hot flashes um, and preventing osteoporosis. It has few contraindications. It does not cause breast cancer. And there are more benefits than risks for women without other contraindications when they start it at this critical window, less than 10 years after menopause and before age 60. So these are the FDA-approved indications for hot flashes, uh, for, for hormone therapy, rather. Moderate to severe hot flashes, prevention of osteoporosis, treatment of premature menopause, and treatment of the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. The benefits of hormone therapy beyond those indications are also that it improves sleep and mood. It reduces the risk of diabetes and heart disease. It improves quality of life, and it may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. And I'll give you a little bit more information about those in a minute. Um, there are some contraindications for hormone therapy. It is not for everyone. Um, if there's uh, any of these are present, uh, it would not be recommended or it would be um, a very you know, careful discussion for someone to be on hormone therapy. Um, unexplained vaginal bleeding, liver disease, prior estrogen sensitive cancer, prior coronary heart disease, stroke, heart attack, or clot, or an inherited risk of a uh, thromboembolic disease, higher likelihood of having a clot. Um, the risks of hormone therapy, I mentioned endometrial cancer. So if there's not, uh, if someone's taking estrogen without progesterone and they have a uterus, they are at increased risk of endometrial cancer, but we don't do that. We try to avoid that. And that's why it's very important for people to understand why they're taking their progesterone. Um, there's a small increased risk of a blood clot and there's a small increased risk of gallbladder disease. The risk of a clot obviously is the, the most um, concerning one of those, the most you know potentially life-threatening. Um, it's really only an increased risk that exists in the first three to six months of use um, for transdermal or uh, estrogen that you absorb through your skin. Um, there's a zero to one in a thousand risk for the oral pills. There's a one to two in a thousand risk. Um, if someone has previously been pregnant or taken birth control pills with no clot, they're at very low risk of having a clot with hormone therapy, which is of a lower potency than the type of synthetic estrogen and birth control pills. Um, it's a higher risk for those who think about initiating hormone therapy more than 10 years post-menopause or over age 60, when they've already had some plaques forming in their arteries and adding estrogen back in might cause those plaques to turn into clots and, uh, and come loose. Gallbladder disease, a low but um, you know notable risk, less again with transdermal than oral estrogen. And what about breast cancer? Obviously it's important to address. Um, the Women's Health Initiative found that there were three additional cases per thousand women over five years of using PremPro, the premren provera combination. And just to put that in context, it was uh, significant in terms of scientific, uh, the, the, the analysis that they did of the numbers at that time, but that's the same risk as someone would incur drinking two alcoholic beverages a day, um, having obesity or low physical activity. So it's, it is overall small and comparable to some modifiable risk factors. 
They also found in the WHI that there was a decreased risk for the women who had 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 a hysterectomy and only took estrogen. And the risk now is more clearly, um, has been more clearly honed in to be caused by the synthetic progesterone, the MPA or Provera that was used in that study. And subsequent other studies that have compared Provera with micronized natural progesterone or Prometrium found that Prometrium does not cause an increased risk of breast cancer. And then there have been other expert reanalyses of these data um, where they eliminated some confounding factors, and they even found that there was no increased risk of breast cancer with any form of progesterone. So I think the take-home message here is if there is any increased risk, it is very slight, and it is associated with synthetic progesterone. So can breast cancer survivors use hormone therapy? I just wanted to go ahead and answer this question because I'm sure many people might be thinking this. This is very controversial. It is definitely not the standard of care. Some experts say yes. There has been a recent journal article uh, in 2022 that concluded that there was no increased risk of recurrence of breast cancer in those um, women using hormone therapy, but it's this is a very controversial and evolving topic. So um, just to be uh, make a really clear distinction between systemic and local or topical estrogen therapy, systemic means that we're using it for hot flashes, prevention of osteoporosis, other symptoms. It gets into the bloodstream. It affects the entire body. It requires progesterone to oppose its effect on the uterine lining, and it's safest when started within 10 years of menopause and under age 60, um, and usually contraindicated with a history of an estrogen-sensitive cancer. Whereas local or topical estrogen that we would use only for genitourinary sy symptoms does not affect our blood levels, it does not affect the uterine lining, and it's only applied topically to the vagina and vulva. It can be started at any age and used forever. There are no increased risks um, that are associated with the systemic hormone therapy, and it can be used by cancer survivors. So just so we're really clear, I'm going to, when I go through other slides, they're going to say systemic. So here's our formulations of systemic hormone therapy. Um, we have oral, we have, um, we have patches, we have mist, we have gel, we have vaginal rings. We have progesterone in capsules or in IUDs. There's also combined estrogen progesterone pills or patches. And all the ones that are starred here are um, FDA approved bioidentical forms. So we have quite a few options in that category. There's a few side effects that people may experience with hormone therapy. They're usually mild and they resolve with time or a change of dose or formula. So it is really important to um, report these things to your provider, to give them a little bit of time, but also to know that you could um, tweak your hormone therapy and maybe get rid of them. Estrogen has definitely been shown to improve sleep and mood, whether people have hot flashes or not. In fact, especially in perimenopause, estrogen has antidepressant effects that are equivalent to those of antidepressant medications in perimenopausal women, whether they have hot flashes or not. That's a very specific uh, window of opportunity, it seems like, to um, affect new mood issues with hormones. Um, if that's something that that person wants to do. Um, estrogen is not government approved. You're going to hear me say this a lot. There's a lot of things that estrogen is good for that is not FDA. It's not FDA approved for. And that's true of a lot of medications. There's a lot of off-label use of many medications. Um, and um, I'm going to be, you know, some of these things are going to be off-label, but just for your information, these are side benefits of estrogen therapy. Um, in terms of Alzheimer's disease, uh, women are twice as likely to have Alzheimer's disease, and we are seeing in the, a, a growing body of evidence that is linking estrogen depletion to the development of brain changes that are associated with, with Alzheimer's. And there is a potential reduction in risk from menopause hormone therapy initiated early in the transition. There was just a large meta-analysis out at the end of 2023 that demonstrated this, and particularly particularly for women who experience early menopause. They're at the highest risk for later in life cognitive decline, and they benefit the most from hormone therapy. Cardiovascular disease is also uh, preventable 
to a degree with hormone therapy when it's initiated in that early window of time. Because estrogen is cardioprotective, it's one of the reasons women have a heart have less heart disease and have it later than men. And women who go through later menopause have lower rates of heart disease because they've had estrogen for longer. It keeps our blood vessels flexible and healthy. It decreases inflammation and it improves circulation. Um, and that's significant because heart disease is the number one killer of women and men. Um, and many people think estrogen should be approved as a um, preventative strategy for heart disease, but it is not, and it, may, it probably will never be, um, simply because the pharmaceutical companies have to have a reason to spend money on um, studies like that to get that type of approval. Um, and they don't need to because they it's already approved. Um, it also reduces the risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and improves blood sugar control for women who have type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's, uh, estrogen therapy is associated with a lower risk of colorectal cancer and no apparent effect on lung or ovarian cancer. Women who are on hormone therapy report less joint pain and stiffness. Um, it, as I mentioned, of course, it's a preventative for osteoporosis, so it helps us prevent our bone density, but it also helps to prevent loss of muscle mass, especially when combined with exercise, and it can help attenuate the abdominal weight gain associated with menopause. Uh, there is a definite benefit in terms of quality of life for people taking hormone therapy related to uh, menopausal symptoms. And there's no time that you have to stop hormone therapy. It used to be, you know, take it for five years or stop at age 65. But the current guidelines state that there is no set time. It is a, um, should be a decision made by a woman with her provider um, in a process of shared decision-making based on her individual risk factors, symptoms, risk for osteoporosis, et cetera. And in terms of the treatment for the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, as I said, that's topical. Um, we've got creams, tablets, suppositories, or rings. And as I said, it can be used by all women at any age and really should be used for life. This is our vul vulvar and vaginal skincare for life. Um, to keep it going, you got to use it um, two to three times a week, depending on what type you're using. Um, and it can be initiated at any age. There's no risk of clot. As I said, there's no risk of endometrial cancer. Um, and also some vaginal moisturizers are a, a great thing for people to use. Um, Silicone-based lubricant is better for frequent use um, over water-based because water-based lubricants can dry the vagina over time. Um, I did want to make a quick mention about testosterone because uh, people are starting to talk about testosterone more around um, hormone therapy. All bodies have testosterone. It's produced in women by ovaries and adrenal glands. So postmenopausally, we still have some production from our adrenal glands, but we do lose a good chunk of our testosterone. And um, unfortunately, it, we really need a lot more studies on testosterone in women. Um, the only thing it's well studied for with really good guidelines is for low libido postmenopause. And there are some great guidelines for that from the Menopause Society. Um, it may also have benefits for sleep, mood, and bone health, um, but it's not standardly prescribed because we don't really have the evidence for other benefits. Um, here's uh, some places to go for more information about this. The Menopause Society has great information at menopause.org, and I'm going to put some of these things in the chat at the end. Um, Estrogen Matters is an excellent book about the history of hormone therapy that was it came out just in, I think, 2021 or two. Um, Hot Flash Hell is one of my favorite um, references for uh, menopause by Dr. Lauren Stryker, and who also has a great podcast called Dr. Stryker's Inside Information. Um, and these are some other great podcasts. We're going to get through this. All right. So I do, of course, I want to get into what's good for people who don't want to take hormones or can't take hormones. We have a lot of non-hormonal prescriptions for hot flashes. Um, most of them are off-label, the SSRIs and gabapentin, um, oxybutynin, which is for overactive bladder, also helps with hot flashes. But we do have a new medication called fiozolinitant or Vioza, 
that was FDA approved in May just for hot flashes. It works on the receptors in the brain that um, affect our temperature regulation. And you guys have probably seen some ads for this because they've really been all over. Um, even starting at the Super Bowl last year, they've been um, blasting the ads for Vioza and it does work. So it's a great option for people who are not candidates for hormone therapy. Um, Non-pharmacological options for relief of hot flashes from the Menopause Society. Um, the best evidence we have um, are for cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnosis, and there's a great app for this called the Evia app and weight loss. There's a long list of things that we don't have a lot of evidence for that may help and won't hurt that are listed here. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that's really a lot about just having studies that are too small to recommend them. Um, so it, it, they may be helpful, but we're not sure. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, I wanted to give you just a tiny taste. It's really just about learning to change our thoughts about our experiences so that we experience them differently. And in relation to hot flashes, I just gave you a quick example here. Somebody has a hot flash in a public place and a typical reaction would be to think, oh crap, not now. People are gonna notice this is so embarrassing. And that stressful thinking actually increases the stress of the hot flash. Whereas learning to practice being ready to think a calmer thought ahead of time, this is just a hot flash, it's going to pass in a moment, that has been shown in randomized controlled trials to decrease the intensity and frequency of hot flashes. So that is pretty amazing. Okay, habits for midlife and beyond. None of these are going to surprise you guys, but I think this is so important because this is really a time that we can turn um, our health uh, and put ourselves on a positive trajectory. Um, a regular exercise really is our best medicine. There is no medication out there that does what exercise does. Um, it prevents cognitive decline. It improves heart health. It improves our sleep, uh, our mood. It improves and uh, sexual function, prevents loss of muscle mass, maintains bone mass. Um, the good news is that at midlife, we don't need to start running marathons to be healthy. In fact, that might be counterproductive. There's some evidence that excess intense cardio at midlife may increase cortisol and um, therefore abdominal and visceral fat. Um, and what, what we really need is regular strength training two or three times a week and regular less intense cardio. Um, as well as there's some good evidence for exercise snacks and short high intensity interval training workouts, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. The ideal is 150 to 300 minutes a week, but please avoid all or nothing thinking if you are not really moving much. Getting started is what's most important. Any movement is better than none. So exercise snacks, I think, is very exciting because um, we the, we hear a lot in the media about our the really the pandemic of oversitting or epidemic of oversitting in our country, um, which leads to high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high uh, blood pressure, blood sugar, high cholesterol, obesity, heart uh, problems. And um, just doing short bursts of exercise for two to three minutes, three times a day has been shown to improve heart health, as well as to improve our endurance, flexibility, muscle strength, and blood sugar. So here's some examples of options for exercise snacks at the bottom, stairs, squats, lunges, jumping jacks, planks, dancing, arm swings, walking. Um, these can be low impact and there's a lot more uh, ideas out there. Um, I think our best combination at midlife is doing strength or resistance training two to three times a week. So we prevent muscle uh, loss of muscle mass and maintain our bone health and um, do some of these short high intensity interval training workouts, which just means that you're doing a short period of exercise, like 20 or 30 seconds, and then you're alternating that with rest. So 20 seconds of squats, 20 seconds of rest, a 20 second plank, 20 seconds of rest. Um, and these can be done on bikes. This is a study that was done a 20 minute HIIT workout on bikes uh, with variable intervals of intensity and rest. Um, and 20 minutes of upper and lower body resistance training three times a week for just 12 weeks um, showed that all of these postmenopausal women had decreased abdominal fat and increased muscle mass. And the abdominal fat, I keep bringing that up because it's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. This is not about um, looking a certain way. This is really about our heart health and our longevity. 
Um, and so it's important to know what, how, if I'm going to start exercising, where's the biggest bang for my buck? And this is where it is strength training and some short hit workouts, and then doing some walking or yoga, some exercise snacks on your other days, just to be moving regularly is really a great combination for midlife women. In terms of diet, um, the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, the MIND diet, these are all um, really good options for ways to eat that mostly cut out um, processed foods and sugar, added sugars, and have us leaning more into fruits and vegetables, lean protein. Um, and this is really, um, these are all good ways to be trying to eat. Um, we think that we should probably be getting more protein than we used to recommend. So aiming for 60 to 90 grams of protein in a day, evenly uh, distributed throughout your meals. Um, 1,200 milligrams a day of calcium, maybe half of that from diet and half from a supplement if you need a supplement for that. And checking your vitamin D levels. I put all that at the bottom just because these are important basics to um, remember. I think in New England in the winter, we probably all need a little extra vitamin D. Okay, here's an. this is just an optional slide for anybody who's frustrated about some unexplained midlife weight gain you'd like to do something about. Um, and uh, the truth is, is that it's not about our metabolism. There was just a recent study that showed that our metabolism doesn't drop until around age 60 and that midlife weight gain is more related to less activity, a loss of muscle mass, overeating, and increased insulin resistance. Um, and again, that increased abdominal fat can increase our risk of heart disease. And part of that is related to a loss of estrogen and can be helped by hormone therapy. So just some ideas, eliminating processed foods and added sugar, watching your snacking, noticing when you're eating and you're not really hungry and trying to do something else that feels good are ideas for that. Um, prioritizing sleep and reducing stress, um, also really important to decrease our cortisol levels. And there's some evidence for the benefits of timed eating. I'm not advocating any kind of uh, extreme intermittent fasting, but at least a 12-hour rest for our gut overnight has been shown to be beneficial for our gut health and our blood sugar. Um, sleep tips. Um, sleep is so important and it can be so hard to get sometimes. Um, so getting a little bit of sunlight first thing in the morning is very helpful for setting our clock and also late afternoon can help our natural melatonin production. Having a pretty regular schedule for sleep, avoiding long naps, but a short midday rest might be good for us. Um, daily exercise, getting the electronics out of the bedroom, only sleep and sex in bed, please and um, a low temperature in your bedroom and time to wind down are super helpful for sleep. Um, stress reduction, here's just um, a few ideas, daily exercise, the cognitive behavioral therapy tools I mentioned, journaling, yoga, breathing exercises. I'm gonna put a link for this physiological sigh in the chat and long hugs are getting a lot of attention because they really do increase our oxytocin. So you can hug your dog, you can hug your friends, your kids, your partner. Um, and if you're trying to create new habits to set yourself up for really good health um, right now and for the future, um, here are some tips. This is from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, which is all about how to start uh, new habits and break old bad ones. Um, uh, so make it obvious, make a plan, make it fun, make it attractive, make it easy, celebrate your wins, have an accountability partner, a friend, a coach, a therapist, a group that you're working out with, whatever, um, and be kind to yourself because new habits take time. So you got to be in the process and be willing to start over just like this, this presentation, right? <laughs> Getting kicked off, starting over as many times as we need to. So there we go. We made it. We're at the end. Thank you guys so much for your attention. Thanks for hanging in. And we will take questions now. All right. Nice so work, Vanessa. Sharing. Thank that you. Was great. We appreciate you. <laughs> and I'm so sorry Thank you had you. technical difficulties. I me too, me too. I do. I'm going to try to uh, just grab those things I wanted to share, but you can go ahead oh, and grab a question. Sure. Um, there are a few. Oh, somebody wanted to blame all the technical difficulties on menopause. So <laughs> that was good. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Sometimes it just seems like there's gremlins in these these meetings. Right? Absolutely. Um, okay. So let's 
see. Mm, this one's a long one. Let's see. Someone, uh, this person has nonstop hot flashes. Mm-hmm. Um, they're on a blood thinner. Um, they can't take hormone replacement. Is there, and this was, er, this question came up earlier on. So obviously you mentioned quite a few mm-hmm. th- things, but the question is, is there anything you can recommend? These yeah. her hot flashes are out of control, she said. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think any of those uh, non-hormonal options would be the place to start. I mean, it would depend on like, you know, other things that are going on. Again, it's got to be an individual um, discussion, but um, she could be a great candidate for Vioza. I mean, that is what that medication was designed for is people who have a cancer history or um, blood clot issues and are just not candidates for hormone therapy. So Vioza could be perfect. Um, Also, a lot of the SSRIs really do work quite well. Gabapentin works particularly well for people at night. Um, And oxybutynin is great for some people too. So Like if you also had overactive bladder, I would go for the oxybutynin. So that's why it's got to be, these are all discussions. It's very individualized care, but there's a lot of options. So I would definitely um, seek some help for that. Oh, great tip. Um, Then there was this question about what about progesterone only pills? And Mm -hmm. I believe that you covered that. um, Well, I don't know if I did really progesterone only pills like birth control pills is is something that people do. Um, There are progesterone only options for people who have contraindications to birth control pills, but there's not a lot. There is, there is some benefit um, shown for hot flashes. I'm just going to speak specifically to that um, with very, uh, with a a higher dose of um, micronized progesterone, 300 milligrams a night. Um, that has been shown to be effective, not as effective as estrogen, but it is an option. It does tend to make people very sleepy, which is good for sleep, but sometimes it carries over into the next day. So it's, it's, you know, it depends on if that was tolerated and, um, if that, why that would be the choice over other things. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I just want to mention, um, for those in the audience that Vanessa did put, a number of links in the webinar chat um, for you to check out to help as um, added benefits for resources. Yeah, most of the, there are all some things that I mentioned in some of the slides for like stress reduction and um, the menopause society and uh, some exercise links and stuff. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the next one, there's a lot of information, but she said, thanks for bringing all this information to women. She recently asked her gynecologist for hormone therapy, um, which has never been discussed in the 22 years of quick care, but uh, she was prescribed estrogilio uh, cream. I'm saying that wrong. Sorry. Standard dose, but never mentioned progesterone. And now she's 54 and experiencing menopause symptoms. Should I be Hmm. requesting something else? And um, what do you recommend? Yeah, I guess it depends on if what she got was just for the vaginal area. Um, If it was an estrogen cream that was just for the vagina and the vulva, then you don't need progesterone. But if it was, if you, if it's something that's supposed to be helping with your hot flashes, that's when you need the progesterone. That was the distinction between the systemic and the local topical. So maybe that she just has something topical that's not getting into her bloodstream and she would want to go back to them and talk to them more about um, if she needs some help with hot flashes. And she has her uterus. Right. And she would need progesterone. <laughs> So uh, this next question uh, is interesting. Uh, Her GYN mentioned um, antidepressants to help with menopause. And Mm -hmm. they're already on antidepressants, um, Mm -hmm. but still have symptoms. Do you have anything to mention about that? Yeah, that was that is on was one of the medications, the non hormonal medications that I had on that slide. SSRIs are typically used for depression or anxiety, and they do help with hot flashes also. So um, I think though that you know there are people that are candidates for hormone therapy, um, but their provider may not be really up to speed on hormone therapy, and they have um, in this twenty years of uh, their honestly, it feels like it was kind of the dark ages of menopause care. Um, there, uh, 
you know, at least we had some things like SSRIs that people were comfortable prescribing, and we've gotten really comfortable at prescribing SSRIs for a number of different indications. So I think there's just some providers out there that are, uh, that's their comfort zone. They haven't gotten any uh, updates on menopause care, um, or this person may have some contraindications to hormone therapy. Obviously, I don't know um, from just this question, but that could be, either of those could be the reason. Um, so if you think that you are a good candidate for hormone therapy, you don't have any of the contraindications, you could certainly go back to your provider or see someone else for another um, discussion about what options are available for you. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, if a patient has a family history of stroke, would you recommend MTH or uh, hormone therapy? A family history? Yep. A family history of yeah. stroke. Mm -hmm. A family history of a stroke is not a contraindication for hormone therapy. There's okay. so many different reasons that can happen. Yeah. That's good. Uh, next question. Uh, Estrogel does does it cause some weight gain and does it cause any lymph node swelling? Estrogel or estrogen, just estrogen. Um, well, I'll just speak to estrogen. You know, which can be in multiple forms. Um, estrogen is not associated. Estrogen for menopause hormone therapy is not associated with causing weight gain. Um, in fact, it can help with a slight reduction in weight, mostly just in the abdominal area um, that um, is associated with that menopause transition. And I don't know of any effect on lymph node swelling. I've never heard that um, com uh, concern about that. Oh, well, thank you. Well, it's mm -hmm. good to get the right facts here then about mm -hmm. that. Um, Oh, uh, Michelle would like to know if you can share the slide with the listing of medications again. Um, and if it would be too difficult to do that, I just want to say that we're recording this and it will be available on our Bay State Health YouTube channel and on our website after the fact. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if she's looking for the medications that are the hormone therapy medications or the non-hormone therapy ones. I don't know. She didn't um, specify. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question, uh, you didn't talk about alcohol use, but it seems not widely talked about that it increases our cancer risk. Are there contra indications with alcohol and HRT? Um, yeah, that's a great question. No, there's no specific contraindications for alcohol and HRT, but you are correct that there um, is some evidence that using alcohol increases our cancer risk. Um, and what's recommended in terms of, um, there's a lot of different, I, they've seen a lot of different things, um, you know, less than three a week, less than five a week, less than seven. This is all from different sources of um uh, in terms of what would be safe. I don't know that we really know what the safe level is. So I think minimizing our alcohol intake um, is a wise choice um, as we get older. Um, um, the next question is, how do you know menopause is starting? Right. Well, again, perimenopause is the beginning of the whole transition. Um, and can be the, the beginning of that. The first signs and symptoms can be anything from, you know, changes in your period to anxiety actually can be a really common first symptom for people. Um, uh, it could be hot flashes, you know, so any of those symptoms um, that start to creep in are going to be your signs that something is starting to shift. Um, and, and again, this is why it's kind of confusing for people. They, they don't notice, they're sort of subtle at first. There's this maybe subtle brain fog, like you start to not be able to come up with nouns and, you know, and you're like, what's going on? Maybe I'm just tired. Oh, I, oh, I haven't been sleeping that well. Oh yeah, I was kind of hot. I've been kind of hot lately. You know, it's, it takes a little while to put it together. It took me a while to put it together for sure. Um, you know, I mean, I thought I was in my early forties. I thought I was too, it was too soon. Um, so I think that, um, it's quite variable, it, even in our, in our, some people in their late thirties are starting to have these symptoms and, um, they could be in the beginning of perimenopause. So it's, it's, a 
It's wow. kind of like a puzzle that you put together. Wow. Thank you. Uh, the next question, how long does menopause typically last? Well, the median duration of hot flashes is seven to 10 years. So it can be longer than that. It can be shorter than that. Um, it really varies quite a bit. Sometimes what happened with your mother will be a good indication, but that's not been the case for me where my mother's like, oh, it's a breeze, nothing to bother me at all. Um, and so, you know, everybody's different. Um, and, uh, and it, it really does vary quite a bit. So it's it's hard to predict in terms of menopause. I, I say menopause lasting being, again, the menopause transition, this whole hormonal transition, um, menopause itself being that end of your periods, but um, everything that surrounds it can last for quite a while longer. Sure. Um, next question. I'm currently 43 and um, have had a history direct to me uh and removal of one ovary my too young for hormone replacement if i have the second one removed 40 years old one ovary left right no yeah. you're definitely not too young um and if you had that second ovary removed and of course i have no idea why you why that was a, um why you did that um what was the indication but um if you remove that other ovary, you would definitely want to, unless you have a contraindication, if you have no contraindication, you'd want to be on hormone therapy because women who go through menopause before age 45 have a much higher risk of um, dementia, osteoporosis, um, heart disease, mood issues related to loss of hormones at that young age. And they actually need um, higher doses of hormone therapy until they are at the average age of menopause. So if there's, you know, if you can keep that ovary and it's functioning, um, that's great. Um, sometimes there is also some evidence that having a hysterectomy or having one ovary removed um, will lead to an earlier menopause than you would have had naturally. So I would say, even if it's still functioning and you're feeling good now, I would just kind of be monitoring yourself for symptoms because you might be likely to go through menopause before age 45. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next question. Until what age can a woman become pregnant relative to perimenopause slash menopause mm. onset? Great question. Yes. Um, well, I mean, you know, the likelihood of becoming pregnant versus how long can we become pregnant? I mean, technically, um, you know, the menopause society says people should be using birth control until, you know, menopause, meaning until you're not having your period anymore, just to be um, very safe. Um, it's incredibly rare. I've, I've had a patient be, uh, have a spontaneous surprise pregnancy at age 47, um, I've heard of it happening even later than that. So it's unusual, but if you are at risk for getting, if you, if you are um, exposed to sperm and you could get pregnant and you don't want to, then I would recommend using birth control until you're, you know, uh, at the average age of menopause, not having a period anymore. And, you know, maybe get a blood, uh, maybe that'd be just a little reassurance to get that, um, FSH level, but it was, you know, kind of putting it all together if you want to stop your birth control. That's one of the reasons why I will make a plug, and I have no kickback from these pharmaceutical companies, I promise, um, for the progesterone IUD as a great method of birth control for perimenopausal women because it gives you your progesterone. If you want to take hormone therapy, it helps um, mitigate some of the crazy periods that you can have during this time frame, and it also gives you, you've got that birth control. It's doing so many things, and it's good for eight years, and it can be a great method to um, to get around that time, and then you kind of don't have to be worrying about it so much exactly like when, um, when that moment occurs that you can't get pregnant because you're covered. That's a great option. Uh, the next question, how do you address postmenopausal sleep issues? Um, yeah, well, if the, if, if it's related to hot flashes and you're in the window that you could use hormone therapy, that would be one that will really help. Um, also if you're somebody that, that can't take estrogen, that is a place where just progesterone might help. Um, and even a non-hormonal type of anything, if, if it's because of hot flashes, anything that helps your hot flashes will help, right? 
Um, and then that's why I also put in that slide about just habits, because um, I think that there's a lot of ways that we can sort of prime ourselves to sleep better um, by using, you know, really good science ev evidence about what promotes healthy sleep. Um, so we have to not run ourselves ragged all day and then expect to just be able to fall asleep and sleep well. Um, that usually doesn't work. So that's why it's important to get off our electronics, wind down. Also, I didn't have a slide about this, but if you're waking up in the middle of the night, there's um, lots of evidence on cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia specifically. And one of the biggest recommendations is don't just lay there in bed awake. And, and, and tossing and turning for hours because then you actually start to develop a, a brain, a mental pathway, a neurological pathway in your brain that thinks you should be awake in the middle of the night in bed. And you think this is how things should be. Your brain is just like, oh, this is what I do. I wake up at 3 a.m. and I toss and turn for two hours and then I fall back asleep for an hour before I have to go to work. It's great. Um, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no. so actually the recommendation is if you've been awake for 20 minutes, get up out of bed and go do something boring. And then when you get tired, come back to bed um, and try again so when you feel sleepy and then try to go to sleep again. Um, and I mean, there's also other things I didn't talk about, like, you know, caffeine and alcohol can also affect our sleep. So avoiding those things, um, if they may be, you know, later in the day, if they may be impacting your sleep. Um, um, but um, yeah, there's a lot to that. So you definitely get some help with it if it's an ongoing issue. For a uh, wealth of time, but I thought we could take a couple more questions. Um, yeah, that's one? fine. I'm good for a few more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one, um, this person would like to know about joint pains. They're experiencing mm -hmm. joint pains, but Mm -hmm. They read that it might be possible. Do you have any insight or is it just age? Is it possible that it's menopause? Related related to menopause joint pain. Yes, definitely. Okay. There's okay. a lot of evidence about that. I did mention that in some of the slides in the Women's Health Initiative, the women that were taking hormone therapy had less joint pain. And there's actually been some really interesting um, studies recently about um, frozen shoulder which is um, actually um, more common in postmenopausal women. And they are finding that um, women who are on hormone therapy have less frozen shoulder. Uh, we don't even totally understand the mechanisms around the hormones and joint pain. But like I said, there's estrogen receptors in every tissue in our bodies. I, I just had a patient who started on hormone therapy who was like, I had all these muscle aches and they're gone. Um, it was pretty um, great to hear. So yes, that could definitely be related to menopause and potentially helped by hormone therapy. Excellent. Great. Um, uh, uh, has research shown um, the length of time a woman can expect to deal with uh, menopause? Yeah, I, I think we kind of talked about that before. Because, it's yeah. sort of like seven to 10 years, but, you know, obviously some of the changes are permanent and genital urinary syndrome of menopause is something that um, we can experience through for the rest of our lives. It doesn't always start right at menopause, but it can, it, it happens to the vast majority of women over time without estrogen in those tissues which is the good news about being able to take it any, you know, using that cream or those tablets or whatever um, at any time through, throughout the lifespan. Excellent. Um, are there any downsides or risks to having stayed on the pill through menopause? The birth control pill, I'm assuming they mean? Yeah. Um, no, nope, that's actually a really viable option for a lot of people um, who are already on the pill. They need birth control and they um, are happy with it and not having any side effects and they can stay on it um, until, you know, generally like in, in you're getting close to 50, it's a good time to think about changing to um, hormone therapy, um, 50, 51, you know, you're pretty much menopausal and again, maybe an IUD, but um, there's, it seems to be a safe option to, to use um, throughout perimenopause. 
Uh, it looks like uh, folks are having trouble with the chat with your links. I'm wondering if mm -hmm. you sent them to everyone um, or just the host. The oh that's such a good point i think you might be right um i didn't realize that let me do this again yeah you have to do the, the drop down mm -hmm. yeah i think i didn't notice that um let me change it to everyone thank you for picking that up so um yeah there we go these are just some um, a couple of midlife exercise people that I really like. Flipping fifty, um, she's great. Deborah Atkinson, um, uh, feisty menopause is. If I didn't say and really address this, but there's anybody out there who's like a hardcore athlete. Feisty menopause is your menopause resource. That is a for, for all like competitive female athletes going through menopause. It's great. Um, Insight Timer is a great one for all kinds of relaxation and stress reduction, um, stuff that's free, menopause.org, of course. Um, this YouTube link is um, to a, a video about the physiological sigh, which is a great, um, easy thing to learn for, uh, again, stress reduction. Um, and then I love these. There's some free self-compassion meditations that are also awesome for stress reduction. So those are just some favorite things. Those are great. Uh, yeah. While we're, while we're giving people time to grab those links before we end, we'll we'll uh, get we have one last kind of note question here. Uh, okay. First great. Started reading the menopause reset, which so far recommends intermittent fasting and mm -hmm. keto diet. Are you familiar with the book and feel it would be helpful? The author is Mindy Pell. And I guess what your feelings are on intermittent fasting and keto. Sure. Yeah. I don't know that much about keto. I'm going to be totally honest. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of very extreme diets like that. Like, I think that they're often hard for people to maintain um, long-term. And I'm more of a fan of people finding a mostly whole foods diet. Like I said, like the Mediterranean diet that they can actually stick with you know, for their whole life. And, and a lot of it is really about, um, looking at those excess, you know, kind of processed foods and snacks and sweets, you know, they're just everywhere, right. In our workplaces, we tend to have them in the break room and, you know, all these things that we've just gotten really used to, um, but, um, don't necessarily serve us. So, um, there is some evidence for intermittent fasting or time restricted eating or timed eating. It has all these different names. Um, I think that the safest way of doing that is to um, aim for 12 to 15 or maybe 16 hours at the most of a fast um, overnight um, and uh, where you're just having water or black coffee or tea, no sugar, no milk. Um, it's not for everyone and it shouldn't be just something that you just jump into uh, abruptly. Um, I would start with 12 hours, which is easy for most people to do that. Like I said, there's evidence for um, benefits for our guts. You know, our ancient ancestors, they didn't eat constantly 24 seven. Their food was really sporadic. Um, so our gut really did develop with the, um, with a, a, a cycle of rest. Um, and a longer rest than many of us give our gut overnight. So um, that I think is definitely beneficial, at least 12 hours. Um, there's some evidence that we move more into fat burning around 15 hours of a fast. But again, it is something you have to adapt to. Um, and um, there is um, a physician um, who has something called a Galveston diet that's for menopause, uh, Mary Claire Haver. Um, I think that is a, a not keto, but does have some intermittent fasting. Um, there's also a book um, called, if, if you're you know looking for something, um, I think that's evidence-based um, by another physician, um, Katrina Ubell, called How to Lose Weight for the Last Time. And she also really gets into um, the food industry and how we have gotten addicted to a lot of foods that are not good for us and how to get ourselves unaddicted from them. And she talks about safe ways of doing um, some timed eating and, um, and building healthy habits for our eating that we can really maintain in a safe way. 
Well, thank and you. And not Vanessa. to say that the book, and also not to say that book that she mentioned is not right. good. I just am not familiar with it. So just to say, right. yeah, right. That's, well, you put some great links, and um, we'll share those links um, in our other platforms. But thank you, Vanessa, for this great talk, for doing so much Q and A, and for our audience for joining us for tonight. So thank you so much for your expertise. We appreciate you. You're welcome. You. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there and have a good night.